Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher, author, filmmaker, and the founder of InPeak, a platform where entrepreneurs and business professionals come to network, learn together, and stay ahead of the curve in the fast-paced world of emerging technologies like blockchain, Web3, NFTs, AI, automation, and so much more. Our guest on today's podcast is Travis Kling of Ikigai Asset Management, who regularly appears on a number of podcasts that I listen to. Travis and I spoke about a number of topics to do with the Web3 space, and we also touched upon something that occupies my mind a lot, which I never used to talk about publicly but I've recently felt more comfortable talking about. That is whether we are living in a simulation, and if so, what does this have to do with the metaverse and Web3? It was a fascinating conversation that you don't want to miss. Before we start, I also wanted to tell you about Athletic Greens, our sponsor for today's show. I started taking their AG1 daily supplement because I work 14 to 15 hours a day and I need a way to stay at my peak performance. Now, I've been taking it for several months at this point and I love it. I definitely feel more mentally alert and I seem to be more energized during my workouts. Honestly, it's no wonder that Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. I wanted to share this with you because I personally have been loving it. To make it easier for you, Athletic Greens is also going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash somi. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash somi to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I know that you have very strong views on everything to do with ESG. So I thought that might be a good place to start, especially because a lot of women don't get into um, crypto because they're like, oh, it's bad for the environment. Uh, You know, there are people who are not buying NFTs because of those things, you know. So I'm always trying to explain and I have YouTube um, content where I explain these things because um, I found it really interesting. So I think... A couple things I would say on that, and I would definitely point to people to Nick Carter's work. He's done a tremendous job fighting the good fight on helping people understand some of the nuances of energy usage for for Bitcoin in particular. Um, I I think uh, Bitcoin mining uh, incentivizes finding the cheapest electricity on the planet. Um, oftentimes that is stranded electricity in the sense that it's electricity that's generated in a place where there is not sufficient demand for that energy generation, which is why the cost of the electricity is low enough there that it can be profitable to mine Bitcoin. It's not profitable to mine Bitcoin in, you know, Austin, Texas, for example, or London, because electricity costs are very high. Instead, you got to go scour the earth to go find where the absolute cheapest electricity is, where it would, you know, in many times just be wasted otherwise. And then the other thing I would say is the importance, the value of a non-sovereign hard cap supply, global, immutable, decentralized, digital store of value, which is what Bitcoin is. The value of that is subjective. It is in the eye of the beholder. And you can argue about whether or not having a money like that, to which there is no comparison, uh, is worth spending, you know, using stranded electricity on or whether that's not. And there's some people that would tell you that, you know, one turn of a windmill turbine is too much energy to be spent on Bitcoin. Uh, and then there's other people, I think especially people that are, are living in places where they don't have access to a stable currency, where they don't have access to a func- functioning financial system, 
that would say that uh, Bitcoin is very valuable uh, and it's well worth the, the electricity that's, uh, that's spent on it. So I think it just depends on who you ask. Yeah, definitely. So, so maybe going back to first principles, can we address this question of why a non-sovereign currency is valuable? Because that's one of the things that I've had many conversations with you know, people who are in um, legacy institutes, you know, traditional banking, and they're like, I don't quite get, I don't understand why this is valuable. Let's say you've, you've gone to a party, a dinner party, and you're sitting next to somebody um, who is like, this is all rubbish. I don't get it. Um, and especially when the prices are down, like it is now, people feel even more that, see, I told you it's not valuable. <laughs> you know? So yes, yeah, so I'd love to you know, hear your thoughts on that. Right. To help understand the value proposition for Bitcoin, it helps to understand the history of money. And it really helps contextualize Bitcoin more. And, you know, we've been using gold to store value for 5,000 years. And before we were using gold, we were using other things to store value. We were using uh, salt and we were using um, these really big, heavy rocks in some cases. And there's a reason why when gold came along, it was deemed to be a superior store of value relative to say salt. And that framework for evaluating stores of value um, is pretty well established. And it's, it's a sort of Austrian economics type of framework. It's hard money versus soft, sound versus unsound money, the six characteristics of money, uh, durable, divisible, portable, uniform, accepted, and scarce. And when you line gold up next to salt within that pre-established frameworks framework for evaluating stores of value, gold is superior to salt. And when you line Bitcoin up next to gold, uh, you can make a good argument that Bitcoin has better characteristics to be a store of value than gold. And then why do you need any store of value? Again, it helps to look at uh, the history of money there. Um, fiat currencies have, have been around um, for about 13, 1400 years. There's a long history of fiat currencies. Every, every fiat currency, and when I say fiat currency, I just mean money that's backed by uh, nothing, essentially backed by the full faith and credit of the government that's issuing it, but not backed by any, any commodity. Um, Every fiat currency in history um, has failed, uh, with the exception of the, uh, the British pound. The British pound's the longest running fiat currency in existence. I think it's about three, four, I think it's 400 years old, I think, 300 maybe. Um, and the British pound has lost 99.5% of its value relative to silver over its history, which is to say that, yeah, it's been around. And it's still it's still it's still around, but it's been a tremendously poor store of value relative to, for example, silver. And so then so then you kind of look at the state of fiat currencies today. You look at central bank actions um, over the last call it 12 years, 14 years um, and the uh, looseness of the monetary policy that's been going on broadly the debt-based uh, global financial system that we find ourselves in at the moment. And you just look at that and you go, what is the likelihood that, you know, this experiment is going to end poorly? And if it does end poorly, what will be the alternative? What could be a potential uh, release valve, escape mechanism out of, uh, you know, this crumbling fiat currency system that we're in right now. And in my opinion, uh, Bitcoin is sort of far and away the leader there. I, and I, I, the, the last thing I'll say on that is um, there was nothing like Bitcoin before Bitcoin. There, there were a handful of different experiments um, that never really got much mainstream traction that, that preceded Bitcoin. And in some ways, Bitcoin is sort of like a greatest hits 
of a handful of different decentralized uh, digital cash projects that came before it. But um, Bitcoin is is unique. And uh, I think when you when you just look at the overall need for that within the context of of, of what we're seeing is uh, in, in macro globally, I, I think just just leads me to believe that um, it's uh, it, it's it's something that's that's very much needed, and 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 that you this idea that you could have a money, in, you know, through the history of money, it was always controlled by um, a, a small group of individuals um, that were running the government, controlling a group of people. Uh, they decided how money was going to work. They decided how the production of money was going to was going to work. The distribution of money was going to work. And so this idea that having open sourced software code, you know, being in charge of the money, that is a brand new idea. But in in my view, when I look at the inherent misalignments of incentives in having a small group of individuals, humans, that decide how the money works. I think with with a decade or a few decades of hindsight, it is going to be viewed as a foregone conclusion and just a sort of obvious fact that it makes more sense to have open source software code be in charge of the money rather than a small group of individuals, you know, that have uh, these misalignments of incentives. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. So. Speaking of that misalignment of incentives, I always talk about tokenization as a way to align incentives. I actually gave a TED talk about this um, a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking about Web3 being the, you know, essentially the next generation of democracy or like, you know, preparing us for the next generation of democracy or decentralization being, you know, uh, the next generation of democracy. Um, And I was explaining about how tokenization can be used as a way to align incentives. On that note, I want to ask your thoughts on other forms of tokenization other than Bitcoin. Are you somebody who um, sees value in other things? Like, like for example, I had uh, Stefan Libera on my podcast um, and he, is pretty much a Bitcoin maximalist, you know, and he's like, he doesn't see the value on in uh, the rest of the blockchain ecosystem. Whereas for me, when I got into uh, this technology, when I became interested in it, I actually first became interested in blockchain technology. And then I got into Bitcoin because when I learned about blockchain technology, I learned uh, the, the first thing that came to me, to my mind was that this is going to, disrupt Amazon, Google, you know, Apple, uh, and, and all those big tech companies. And that's the first thing, like, I remember like walk, having a walk and I was listening to this book about blockchain technology in 2017, 18, and thinking this is going to disrupt Amazon. Like, like, that's all I could think about. And for me, that was interesting. I was like, you know, what's going to be the next uh, disruption? I want to learn about it. I want to be at the forefront of it. So I see that value very clearly, but I'm always surprised when some Bitcoin maximalists don't see that. Um, Of course, when you start experimenting, it's never going to go smoothly. You know, of course, there will be problems. Of course, you know, the Ethereum merge is going to take forever, you know, and and all of those those things. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So so a couple of things I'll say on that. Um, There's many different proposed use cases for blockchain technology. You know, the adoption rate, the sort of traction success of these different use cases varies widely. Um, The use of blockchain technology as a non-sovereign digital store of value. Bitcoin is, you know, far and away right now the uh, use case that has gotten the most traction. Um, I would say that smart contract platforms are another uh, use case for blockchain technology that's gotten significant traction. When evaluating all these different potential use cases, we I have this framework I've been using for a few years now 
It's been very helpful. And it's, it's four questions. And it's, it's how ready is the tech for the world? How ready is the world for the tech? What do you need decentralization for? And how decentralized is decentralized enough? Because a, a blockchain, like a private blockchain is just a Excel spreadsheet, or it's like a Google sheet, basically. And yeah, maybe there's, you know, there are use cases for sharing Google Sheets. Um, but that's like much more of like a minor evolution to like, I don't know, sort of like data management relative to the revolution of a non-sovereign form of money. And so I, so I like those four questions a lot. And then the other framework that we use a lot is that you have the value that is potentially created by a technology and you have the value that is potentially accrued by the token. Those are two different things value creation versus value accrual. The bridge between those two things is token structure. By token structure, I just mean, how does the supply and demand of the token intersect with the use case of the technology? And value accrual is still a very unanswered question in crypto, especially outside of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's value accrual comes from the, the, the market applies a monetary premium to Bitcoin because it has the characteristics of a good money. Uh, it has high, high moneyness in, in Austrian economics terms. When you step away from Bitcoin, that value accrual gets, you know, in these other crypto assets gets much shakier uh, more quickly. I remind people that there is still no proof of stake crypto asset that has been successful over any meaningful period of time at a large scale. Um, ETH is trying to do that right now. I'm, I'm hopeful that they will be successful in that. I believe that they will be successful in that, but there's a lot of risk there. Um, so even, you know, something as, as fundamental to crypto as proof of stake is still unproven in terms of its ability to, to accrue value. When you step outside of some of these other use cases, um, I believe that layer one smart contract platforms do have a very bright future. Um, and whether that's Ethereum or something else or some combination of Ethereum and other, other things, Solana, Avalanche, Luna, Atom, Dot, something else that hadn't been invented yet or that I didn't name. And my general view there is that I think that big tech, you know, so, so technology broadly is becoming increasingly more intertwined with humanity. That is a trend that I strongly believe is set to continue. And there are societal problems that the centralization of big tech is causing. And one of the ones I like to point out is the sort of search algorithms or the display algorithms of social media platforms inherently create echo chambers. And those echo chambers inherently lead to uh, divisiveness. And now we find America in, you know, its most divisive time since probably the civil rights movement. And I think social media has really contributed a lot to that. And it is the ads model in the context of a publicly traded corporation that has shareholders and profit expectations that has led to this ad-based revenue model that leads to the echo chambers inherent in the search algorithms that lead to the divisiveness. And so, so, so I, think, I, I think you're seeing these types of things pop up with big tech companies. And I believe that having decentralization as a technological foundation has the potential to alleviate um, some of those problems inherent in centralized tech companies. So I'd say that that's my very basic thesis for like why the world, you know, needs 
smart contract platforms. There's other reasons. And, and you know, the ownership economy, the the foundations of, of sort of Web3 versus Web2, Web I believe in that as well, too. So, well, that's that's really that's good to hear. Um, can I ask you something? Do you have any NFTs? Uh, we have some, yeah. Not a lot of not a lot of profile pictures. We have a good amount of in-game asset in FTS. Okay. Um, not a lot. Of, not a lot of profile pictures. Uh, and uh, are you involved in any DAOs? Have you had some experience with DAOs? Yeah, some. The reason why I'm asking that is, like, when you get involved in the NFT culture, you really see how interesting it is. Like, you you definitely feel that there's something there. And I didn't take it seriously at first. I was like, oh, you know, I'm not sure. And one of my hesitations for it was that you are, that it's much more expensive to, you know, most of the time to, to get in, you know, and then when you do get in, if you need the liquidity for any reason, there's no guarantee that you can get that liquidity at the time that you need it. But of course, there are many ways to circumvent that, you know, if you can try and get on the mint list, et cetera. Like now I have a Moonbird, you know, that was, that's like something that I managed to get on the mint. So like, you know, that makes a big difference because now even, even when the price is down, I'm still like almost 10 times up, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's so much that I'm kind of learning from being part of these communities that I, I feel like that this is the start of a new way that social media, if, if you will, maybe social media is not the right word, but you know, social is being created, a new evolution of it. So what are your thoughts on Meta and their foray into the metaverse, if you will, yeah, and, and how they're trying to adapt? When I speak to the general public, who have never heard the term decentralization, who don't know much about these things, they don't know the difference, right? And I, my worry, my two of my biggest worries is, one is the likes of Meta hijacking, you know, what was being built in, what I say was, what is being built in, in Web3 and the decentralized model of these um, companies trying to, uh, you know, tokenize and, and bring in people into their ecosystem. The second is, I have heard some people say that I'm not interested in crypto. I'm going to wait until the official government versions, i.e. CBDCs are out there, right? Yeah, so I think it's very clear that centralized technology, tech companies, gaming companies are moving hard at Metaverse. Um, and that that they view that as a major trend. Um, and I agree with that. And I, I, if you've seen the movie Ready Player One, you know, it's my medium conviction based case that we're just steadily moving towards a Ready Player One world. And I think, you know, in, in Ready Player One had a, a pretty dystopian uh, component to it. And I think whether or not it's dystopian or a more utopian outcome remains to be seen and is going to be a function of the collective efforts of the individuals that are working on sort of, you know, one outcome versus the other. And, you know, I don't know if Mark Zuckerberg is a good guy or a bad guy. Um, I don't know if you listened to him on the Lex Friedman podcast. Yeah, for folks that haven't listened to that, I highly recommend that. In fact, I would recommend you actually watch it on, on YouTube so you can kind of watch him. I would say he's not a, he's not a glaringly good guy um, to me, but admittedly, he also has just a very hard job, very hard job. And um, But when I just think about technology you know, you know, you know, humans are very likely to spend more and more time existing digitally and less and less time existing in analog. And when I look at the problems that social media are causing in society right now, if we're going to, if technology is going to become increasingly more entwined and in, intertwined with humanity, then that sets up for the potential for those problems to be exacerbated. And that's how you can imagine this movement towards 
something that's more dystopian, something that is more like Ready Player One, you know, the movie. And I, I just, it's, it's what I said earlier. I just believe that decentralization, that having decisions and, and incentive stru- decisions being made and incentive mechanisms set in a decentralized manner where millions of people around the world own a token that's representative of this te- of a technology platform that accrues the value that's created by that technology and decisions are made in a decentralized manner you know like you know ethereum is somewhat decentralized it's not it's not as decentralized as a dao but it's i would say somewhat decentralized uh bitcoin is even more decentralized than ethereum Bitcoin is far and away the most uh, decentralized, you know, crypto asset project. And then I look at at the innovation that's happening in DAOs right now, which just looks like the very earliest stages of a massive trend. Like it's just going to be an innovation on human organization, basically. And I, and I just think like DAOs are at the top of the second inning of what I think they're going to end up doing. I think we've only just begun to see the innovation of human coordination that will take place there in the coming years and decades. And I think DAOs will probably end up as like the layer two of human civilization. And we're at the very beginning of that trend. And that just so clearly strikes me as a fight worth fighting. Like, what do I want to spend my time doing? I'm 37 years old. I'm going to be working for another couple of decades. Like, what do I want to spend my time doing? And it really just seems like trying to do my little part to push, you know, all of this in, a, in you know, a step or two in the direction towards leveraging technology to empower humanity and not the other way around. That really just strikes me as a, as, as, something worth spending the rest of my career working on. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know what? I'm going to take the conversation in a slightly different direction because I want to talk about a topic that I know you are interested in because you talked about it at the end of the conversation you had with Lisa McCormack. And it sort of circles back into this whole concept of technology and and humanity. Um, So at the end of that conversation, you guys went into or you mentioned something about the possibility of this being a, a simulation. Uh, uh, you mentioned a few things that, and like that Peter wasn't um, familiar with. And, and he said, you know, give me some recommendation or something like that. I remember. So I was listening to this on my phone. So immediately as I finished it, uh, finished the podcast, I sent Peter an email. And this is basically, these are the recommendations I gave him. I was like, here are a few sources that you must check out about the simulation theory. The Case Against Reality by Donald Hoffman. Also listen to Lex Friedman's interview with Joshua Bach. Listen to both interviews. It's about six hours in total. Um, Bach will blow your mind. I listened to the first interview three times. Also check out uh, interviews and writings of Nick Bostrom, uh, author of Superintelligence. Yeah. So, and then Peter replied and said, thanks mate this was great thanks dude or something i was like no mate it's just it's like you know (laughs) lady over here but yeah (laughs) you know you're welcome um so so i'd love to explore that because it's not every day that i get to talk to somebody who um explores these topics you know and and it's something that i think a lot about and i feel like we are throughout humanity's life um you know uh lifespan in terms of our history Uh, we've gone through a number of different upgrades and after each upgrade you know maybe in this simulation or whatever it is that new doors open and like we we come up with new ways of new understanding and understandings of the laws of um, physics and I wonder you know I just have this very strong feeling that we're going towards another one of those big upgrades and and this money revolution money um, technology is uh, is one of those. Also, as a philosopher, you know, as a tech philosopher, one of the thoughts that I have about technology is that 
we always think of technology as being a set of tools and techniques that enhance our ability. But what if technology is a life form in its own, in itself, mm -hmm. and we are co-evolving with it? You know, uh, when you think about going all the way to uh, the beginning of life, you know, what is life? Life is essentially where uh, these random particles get together and try to overcome entropy. And, and that process is called, uh, a, you know, life, right? And when that life becomes um, aware of itself and tries to improve that, that active push towards evolving that, you know, that's where, you know, we see technology. Um, so I guess where I'm going with this is that I'm trying to kind of get a sense for hypothetically, if we said that we are living in a simulation and we are going towards this singularity, you know, which seems like increasingly likely to be the case that we are going towards a accelerated phase of evolution, that something big is on the horizon. I don't quite know what, but I just have this strong feeling that I feel like I'm preparing for something. I don't quite know what. Just was wondering, very wild thoughts. Do you have any hunches, any inclinations about these? I mean, gosh, we could go hours on this. The first thing I'll say is that my view on all of this is evolving pretty rapidly. So I'm like not tied to anything in particular um and you know I, I i probably have some hunches but i'm certainly not married to any particular view and i plan on spending the rest of my life trying to learn more and understand more and develop you know more hunches you know or 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 get higher conviction in in, in some hunches the first thing I'll say is my view on simulation theory comes from the stance of I was raised Christian. I still consider, consider myself a Christian. I, I think even more than considering myself a Christian, I consider myself a follower of Jesus Christ. I, I, I was raised a, a, a uh, a, a type of Christian called Southern Baptist, which is like a pretty devout, pretty fundamental type of Christianity. I was raised to read the Bible literally and to take the Bible at literal face value. And when, you know, Moses parted the Red Sea, that he parted the Red Sea. And when Jesus fed the 5,000 with two loaves of bread and, and a couple fish, that he literally did that. As I've gotten older and uh, done more studying, read the Bible more, read other religious texts more, listened to a lot of uh, biblical scholars, dug more into the, the historicity of the Bible, sort of what is the historical record of biblical accounts outside of the Bible. My views have evolved. Um, as I've read more philosophy, my views have evolved. Mimetic theory from Rene Girard has been a philosophy, I think, that has stuck with me and, and that uh, Christianity and the story of Jesus Christ as a framework for dealing with and approaching mimetic theory is a concept that makes sense to me. And as I've gotten older and moved away from being locked into having to grapple with the literalness of the Bible and that the Bible may be less literal and more metaphorical or, you know, analogies, you know, a sort of a guidebook that was written over thousands of years of humanity on how to give humanity its best shot at uh, excelling. And at propagating our species and, you know, advancing humanity. So all these things have been evolving in my, in, in my mind for, for years and in my heart for years. And then it, it's that pretty heavy focus on faith in conjunction with quantum physics is like a 
favorite hobby of mine. And the two areas of podcasts that I listen to outside of like crypto and macro, which I listen to a lot of crypto and macro podcasts outside of that, I listen to like human performance optimization podcasts like Huberman Labs and, and, and people like that. I listen to a lot of quantum physics podcasts, watch a lot of quantum physics, YouTube videos, that sort of thing. I'm very fascinated by it. It helps me navigate that journey through my faith that I was, uh, that I was just describing. And when I listen to these world-class experts on quantum physics, talk about the state of, of, you know, what the quantum physics community knows, what they don't know, what leading theories might be. Um, when I listen to these world-class experts talk about, about that sort of thing, I am constantly struck by this feeling that it sounds like somebody inside of the video game describing the video game. And that quantum physics at the particle level is like somebody inside of the video game trying to scientifically nail down the bits that make up the video game, the ones and zeros that make up the video game. And when I listen to them talk about the macro quantum physics, you know, the, you know, talk about Big Bang, talk about um, what we know about the expansion of the universe, talk about multiple dimensions. That sounds like somebody inside of the video game trying to describe what the sort of outside, the outer walls of the video game are like. Um, and I'm reminded, if you've ever seen the movie, The Truman Show with Jim Carrey, I'm reminded of when at the end of the movie, when he gets he's on the boat and he is sailing towards uh, the horizon. And then he just like runs into this wall that's uh, a bunch of clouds. It's like the end of this simulation that, that's been created for for that character. And quantum physics, is you know, I have zero academic training in it. And it's 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 such a complex topic that I can't I cannot regurgitate it very well. I just consume a lot of it, but I I've never written about it before, so I don't I don't have my words very well formulated. But I just increasingly get the, the this this feeling that these scientists are characters inside of a video game describing a video game, and I think for some fundamentalist Christians that would be a very heretical thing to say, a very anti-Christian thing to say, but there, there's been nothing in my exploration of that, that potential that, that this is a simulation theory that feels at odds with my faith, at odds with the belief that I have in God, the, the personal relationship that I have with God. Th there's no misalignment in my head with that. And it's like, it is a journey. It is like the single most important journey in my life, even more so than crypto and, and, and trying to push this, this technology and this asset class to fill its potential to make the world a better place. That journey is even more important than the crypto journey, although I do think of them as being very much intertwined. It's why I named my firm Ikigai. Uh, Ikigai is an ancient Japanese concept that means reason for being. If you if you Google it, you'll see this Venn diagram that comes up. The Venn diagram is what you like to do, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you deserve to be paid for. And if you find those four things, they say you kind of find your 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 Ikigai, your reason for being. And the concept of Ikigai very closely intertwines with my faith and my decision to leave traditional hedge fund investing to move into this technology was very much based on uh, trying to do good in the world in this, you know, blink of an eye that, that, that we're here. Yeah, definitely. A lot of that resonates um, with me. I, I mean, I, um, I grew up in a Muslim family, so I became an atheist quite uh, early on in my life because um, it's really oppressive uh, for women, but you know, I don't know whether, but I, I don't even use the term spiritual. Uh, like I don't necessarily do that. Um, I don't know what it is. I just know that, you know, I meditate. Um, I, uh, you know, I do transcendental meditation. Um, I, I think that uh, 
there is obviously many layers of reality that we uh, don't know about. And when I meditate, um, I always like sort of request to, I don't know, uh, whatever is, you know, that, that uh, you know, bigger kind of layers if, to give me access to that because I want to understand, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to understand uh, what it is. Um, and there, there's understanding and then there's knowing, right? So, uh, so there, uh, you know, I think those two things are different. So there are things that I feel like I know, but I'm always worried that if I feel like I know something, you know, like you, your faith, you know, that's probably something that you feel like you know, right? But, that, but at the same, same time, I always think like, do I really know? Like, do I really, you know? So, so I'm, I'm always- well, it, not, not, not to interrupt, but I will, I will just say, if you really knew, they wouldn't call it faith. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, so I guess, you know, that's why in that sense, maybe uh, it's better to say that I don't necessarily have faith, but I'm, I'm very open to it. You know, I'm like trying to uh, understand better, trying to know. And I definitely do go inwards. I, I have a lot of meditative time. Um, and, you know, I just want to know whether... Uh, it, well, it's sort of like this whole simulation theory, theory makes a lot of sense to me because I feel like now, as we go into the metaverse, when you think about gaming, you know, we are now creating our own version of it, yeah. right? Like we are all great. I, I wonder whether this life is like layers after layers after layers of simulation inside each other, you know, that, that like we create, um, you know, the, our own version of, of it. And, um, and then as that becomes more sophisticated, then those characters within that simulation create their own simulation and so on and so forth. I, I very much agree with that. My time researching metaverse, spending time actively investing in the metaverse space has definitely helped frame my view on the likelihood of of this being a simulation. And I think just being a technology investor now for, which I was not before I got into crypto, you know, now for four years, five years now, that seeing the pace of innovation and acknowledging that innovation is accelerating at an accelerating pace, I believe that that's a fundamental aspect of digital innovation because it's like roughly governed by something like Moore's Law um, accelerating and accelerating pace. And when I just think through the next couple hundred years, which in the history of the universe is it's less than a blink of an eye, a couple hundred years is like, it's, it's not even a rounding error. That's such a short amount of time. But when I think about the way that it looks like metaverse is evolving and over the next couple hundred years, what is the likelihood that humans create inside metaverse, a metaverse or metaverses sort of like non-playable characters that have this sense of a soul. I believe in souls. I believe we all have a soul. I believe that souls are an aspect of us that transcend space and time and, and physics and the five senses, the way we experience everything else. And uh, that it is what connects all of us together. And it's what connects us to uh, a higher power. And what's the likelihood that we can, over the next couple hundred years, create something like that for like non-playable characters inside of metaverses. And that just seems like, pretty likely to me and then is the creator of that metaverse then the sort of god for that non-playable character and that those non-playable characters inside of these metaverses then begin their own journey of trying to understand how that world was created that they are inside of and that's to your point about like this uh, about the sort of series of, of, of metaverses. And that, that, that is a concept that very much resonates with me. And it's something I would have had no uh, framework to try and think through 
had I not been just net deep in this, in this asset class and in technology broadly for years. Um, the, the other thing I'll, I'll just mention, mention your, your, your raised Muslim. I, I've been spending a lot of time uh, reading about, learning about the comparative differences and similarities of like major world religions. And there's a lot of similarities across them. And a lot of different major religions have very similar stories with just different names and the details filled in differently. And my acceptance of that is also a view that fundamentalist Christians would feel would be, you know, pretty anti-Christian. But it, it has led me to want to dig deeper and be more open minded into what are the fundamentals Un underlying all major religions? Where do the similarities seem to be? And then how does that tie in with my own firsthand experiences that I've had with, with God and trying to tie all of that together? Because it's I'm a natural skeptic. I'm deeply skeptical of, you know, about most everything. And I think I'm also just a realist when I, I know that through the really all of the history of humanity, we've been controlling and killing one another for the entirety of humanity. Uh, and it seems to be fundamental in our DNA that we have this desire to control and kill in order to control. And humans have just been doing that like forever. And I believe that organized religion has been used as a tool to control other humans for as long as there's been religion. You know, it, it's like it's like religion started, I think, as a way for humanity to try and understand why things were happening in the world. Why was there a sun? Why was there a moon? Why did the sun set and then the moon come back up? Why do the oceans move? Why are there rainstorms? Why, you know, it was, it was, it was a framework before there was the ability to do science for that. But then very quickly thereafter, it just began to be co-opted as a way to control other humans. And golly, the amount of, the amount of humans that have been killed by other humans in the name of religion, it's like, you know, it's probably been more humans killed in the name of religion than it has been in anything else. And so, but there, there, there seems to be an inherent, I, I believe in the inherent duality of man and that we all have this tendency to have this push pull inside of ourselves where we want to do good, but we don't always do good. We seem like we can't always do good and that we say hurtful things to one another. We do hurtful things to one another, that we act in a selfish manner, but that we also have an inherent love for one another as well, too, and that we do want to do good. And that the existence of that duality that I believe is inherent in mankind, whether you believe in a God, whether you believe in straight, you know, if you don't believe in a God, you know, I still haven't gotten any answers from this quantum physics podcast about if you don't believe in a God, like who created the Big Bang and like what's outside of this universe. But like my point being is that like if you believe in a God, it seems like God created us to have this duality inherent in us. Or if you just believe in straight evolution that we came from amoebas, you know, billions of years, it took, took us billions of years to get from amoebas to humans and somehow the Big Bang happened without a God. It does still seem to be that this duality is inherent in the way that humanity works. And a lot of times I think that that duality comes from scarcity and that humans and all animals exist in a scarce world and that our willingness to be hurtful to each other, our ability to do that stems from a lot of DNA that evolved in a, a, an environment of scarcity. And that 
God that the story of Jesus Christ, which is unequivocally a story of love and sacrifice, unconditional love and selfless sacrifice, that that is a, a framework for approaching and dealing with our duality. And that if humanity can overcome the negative side of duality, that the species will thrive and propagate and that we can move towards utopia and that technological innovation, which has been the separating factor for humans versus any other animal on this planet, right? We figured out fire, then we figured out how to cook food, and then you know, we figured out the wheel and then, you know, we figured out the steam engine and then we figured out electric, you know, it's like innovation is what is what separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom and that technological innovation can lead to utopia and can lead to um, a, a very happy, less scarce, abundant existence for our species. Uh, But that we have to overcome the darker parts of our nature, that the, the, the negative side of duality and that faith and that a belief in God and having that structure is like a framework for navigating that. Yeah, definitely. Whether you have uh, faith or not, um, and whether this is a simulation or not, suffering is real. And uh, anything that, um, that causes suffering, you know, I have suffered, I know what it's like, you know, I, I, I was born during the Iran-Iraq war. Um, So uh, I know the feeling of growing up during war. I know the feeling of, you know, oppression, all that stuff, whether this is a simulation or not. I think the feeling of happiness and suffering are the things that we know to be feeling good or bad. And, you know, the, the least that we can do is to minimize suffering for others and maximize happiness. Uh, you know, for others and ourselves. You know, this has been a really, really interesting conversation. I've done dozens and dozens of podcasts. I've never done a podcast about about that particular topic before. So this is great. I should have you back and, you know, we can schedule more time um, and and talk about it more. I would really love to, um, yeah, explore these, these topics with people who are investing in these technologies right now, in the metaverse especially, because, um, you know, what... I'm building uh, a platform that is really focused on emerging technologies and and getting more people together, you know, like through our NFT release. Initially, we were focusing to uh, encourage more women in in this space, but actually we are now rebranding and uh, becoming, you know, completely inclusive because um, women do tend to be a little bit slower to get on board with new technologies so i think they need more support so we are going to be building a section within the platform to support women to uh, you know to come into these technologies and topics and start thinking about them more um, but we need to go at a faster pace and, and like be more inclusive and bring in a larger um you know larger group of people into it so on the surface right now, most of our focus is around Web3, but actually there is a bigger plan and thinking behind it. So I'm building this uh, NFT project, which is uh, inspired by philosopher Nietzsche. I'm a, I'm a Nietzschean, you know, like, and I'm really interested in this concept of the Ubermensch. Um, really trying to encourage more people to think about big picture, because as we are going into this era of NFTs, DAOs, there's a lot of focus on, yes, art, yes, there is, you know, speculation speculation around, um, you know, pricing, all that stuff. But I really would like, I feel like this is an opportunity to also encourage science and technology and, you know, thinking about, and philosophy and thinking about the big picture. So really, I'm trying to build a a community of people who want to learn practical skills of thriving in this era of Web3, but at the same time, also talk about and, and explore other topics that are, you know, that like, like this. Is this a simulation? How do we get access to our source code? You know, and, and um, you know, could it be that like Elon Musk is trying to take us to, the, uh, to, to Mars? Could it be that we don't need to, you know, that what if we get access to our source code and and we find new ways of um you know just like einstein 
you know, came up with the idea of relativity and that changed the paradigm around, you know, macro physics. So could it be that a similar kind of paradigm is, is on the horizon that we could be exploring it? So right. I feel like there are so many parallel things happening. So one of the things is I'm really interested in the future of education because we have got the traditional kind of universities. They're very slow. You know, there's like there are things that are taboo. And I just wonder whether there is a way for us to build almost like a new kind of university, new kind of, you know, education that allows for slightly more open, um, you know, a conversation around topics that uh, are like the simulation theory, you know, and what if we right. seriously start to explore these things? Um, also, have you read The Singularity is Near? No, I'm not. I'm familiar with it, but I have not read it. So Ray has got, Ray cares well. He's got another book coming up, which is called The Singularity is Near. <laughs> and I, I wonder whether he's going to go into this whole topic around it. But I really feel like something big is happening, uh, you mm-hmm. know, and we are on the verge of something. You know, by 2029, AI potentially will be passing the Turing uh, test and it's becoming more and more intelligent. And at the same time, that going hand in hand with blockchain technology could be very, very interesting. Should be. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'd love to have you back. And uh, yeah, let's let's explore more. Yeah, it sounds good. Thanks for the time. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Travis Clink. Be sure to follow him on Twitter at Travis underline Clink. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. The full interviews are also available on my YouTube channel, The Somi Ariane Show.